Hey Wargamers, welcome back to the channel, Death From Above Wargaming. I'm Aaron. And I'm Kevin. And we are back tonight with another video. Very excited to announce the release of the DFA campaign system. So this is the rule set that we've been playing with for the last two campaigns. It's been refining. Brewing over time. Yes. Sort of stewing in our minds and playing out on the table. Right. But I think we've tuned it to the point where it's ready for release. I think I we're ready to it. share it with the public and I agree. put out the rules and get your guys' feedback. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's um, it's definitely matured at this point. Um, you know, we played, I think, the whole second campaign with this rule set. We only made a couple of minor tweaks at the end there. Um, so, so it's good to go. Now, uh, it's important to note that this is based on Catalyst Game Lab's uh, Chaos Campaign Supplement. Yeah. Um, there was a lot in there that was really good. Um, there were some things in there that um, I think there was opportunity for improvement. I think there were some things that, I don't know, we just didn't like um, that happens. Yeah. Um, and there were other things that I think, um, you know, we just had to tweak a little bit, yeah. right? And for any of those that are familiar with our channel and our bat wraps, you know, we, we sort of house rule things that we find. We, we try to optimize speed, efficiency, and just sometimes just just balance, fun. balance, balance right. and just, fun. Just yeah. make it easy to play and easy right. to remember. So we kind of took the campaign system for chaos and made it our brand. Right, right. So yeah, so let's couple, get into it. Yeah, let's get into it. So, so what we're going to do tonight, a couple quick things. Um, we're going to walk through um, section by section of, of the PDF here. We're going to go through each of the major sections and kind of talk through how this thing works. Yeah. Um, so these rules can be found right now on our website, dfawargaming.com. There's a, a link up in the top right hand to the download section. Um, so we'll have this PDF, uh, which includes all the rules and the missions. We'll also have a standalone PDF with just the missions. And then we'll have a bunch of other uh, record sheets for all of the mechs that we use, all the customized mechs. Uh, the Queen Crab, for example, mm. which I know is a fan favorite. <laughs> also for download uh, on the website as well. So let's dive into this. Uh, we are going to start with what? Campaign setup? Yeah, as all things should start. Okay, so in the campaign setup here, uh, there are there are six main sections or six main parts, if you will, um, to this. The first one being just figuring out fluff, fluff, right? The sort of the the location, the factions involved. You know what planet you're playing on. Systems. Um, what systems? It could be a multi-system, multi-planet invasion. It could be whatever you want it to be, right? Um, you know, I, I we played campaigns for other war games where you know we have an overland map and, and units move. We yeah. we took all that stuff out of this system. However, if you want to do it, do it, right? I mean, it's very easy to yeah. overlay this um, this setup. You know, for the fluff part, really is just about sort of setting the stage, right? Yep. Um, the, the second thing is really getting into the nuts and, and time bolts. period. That's probably an important thing, Ooh, too. It kind of just sets the ground level for this is the tech level right. you can expect. Yeah. This is sort of the restrictions on forces yeah. and unit types. So important, but also just sort of a mutual decision who you're playing with. What do you guys want to play with? You yeah. know? Some Dark Age. I want to play with some Industrial Max. I don't, but with, that's with a Fibro Thresher. <laughs> 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 All right, so... Um, the next thing is force size, right? Yeah, I believe so. When we uh, when we think about um, what we're gonna play here, is it's like you know, do you want to play uh, a huge company, a regiment, you know? And this is over the scope of the campaign. Don't think just the battle. Like over the course of the campaign, what is the, what are all the miniatures? What are all the units you're gonna bring to bear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, over and, the course of this. And so if you notice on our channel, um, and we fielded some questions from our viewers about how we handle things like the force multiplier, you know, why do we why do we just stick with 4v4s? You don't have to, right? But I will I will say wholeheartedly It's a good barometer. It's a good barometer, right? If you start going um, you know, bigger, obviously the games take longer. And if you want to play, you know, games that span a whole weekend, I think that's awesome. You know, if you want to stick to like two to three hour games, you know, four v four typically is where it's at. Those seem to be Pretty quick, pretty balanced, pretty fair. Um, 
you know, so it's good. It's good to kind of think about how many mechs you want on the field in total, but also you know how big right. you know each game is going to be. And, and the spirit of the rules that follow are sort of optimized for that play, but obviously scalable for whatever you want to do. Mixed arms, you're gonna bring a whole bunch of vehicles. Yeah, um, you it's can. up to you, right? Yep. There, there's nothing that's going to restrict that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so speaking of mixed arms and, and bringing lots of stuff to the table. Uh, what's important is is who's driving, right? Who's piloting? Who's driving? This stuff really drives um, the campaign balance. You yep. don't want to fight. You know, if you don't, if you don't want to bring like a whole bunch of a giant assault mechs with four or five pilots, and you're yeah. playing against you know a bunch of lights and mediums with these crack shot ace pilots. Um, so what what we have in the rules is sort of a mutual agreement between the players. Uh, you know, hey, we each get a two, three, you know, that's kind of your leader. You can get any number of three, fours, and a couple of four, fives. And that's more so so you can't, like, game the system, because you're going to agree on, like, a set number of units. You're going to agree on BV at some point. Right. You don't want to be able to have someone game the system with a bunch of, you yeah. know. yeah. Super elite pilots, or vice versa, super, a bunch of green pilots, and have like what are you trying to say? Five time. <laughs> <laughs> I've, have I done that? It reminds me of the Whitworth in the Possibly. first campaign, <laughs> which was a learning lesson, incidentally, from that first campaign when yeah. I had that Whitworth with I think a gunnery one or two. I don't even remember, yeah. but he just destroyed everything in his life. Why, why is your CEO in a Whitworth? <laughs> <laughs> right, he's just marching around, just bullseyeing people with LRMs. Anyway, but so it's part it, of the fluff too, right? I mean, you kind of want like a balance that way you have a healthy mix of pilots mm -hmm. without having just a, a fully off the charts force or just a fully green force. I mean, but it's up to you. It's right. Just, it's, it's another one of those things we're not imposing limits. It's just come to an agreement because yeah. it's important for both players right. or other players coming to this campaign to have yeah. that sort of level setting in the beginning. This is what we are going to come to the table with. Agreed. Yeah. And like, you know, you do clan versus inner sphere. Obviously the things may not equal up, yeah. um, but it avoids um, arguments later. It, it definitely avoids. How dare later. you bring that one three Whitworth? Whitworth how dare you? Uh, <laughs> good old slap shot. You know, living the dream. Uh, so uh, the next section is force battle value. Yeah. So this is the battle value of everything that you want to bring. So we talked about deciding a size, right? So we typically play a campaign where each each person brings ten max. Yep. So force battle value is well, how many points do I get to cram those ten max into, right? Um, and so we have some guidelines in the PDF on what we think worked in the Succession Wars era. Now, obviously, as you increase the tech level, that's going to go up. Um, but, you know, basically think like, hey, you know, our average pilot's going to be, let's say, a 3-4, right? Yep. Which, incidentally, is the Chaos Campaign's average pilot, um, which is sort of a step up from the 4-5 uh, in the days of yore. Right. Um, we find that, that that it's actually a good... It's a good balance, yeah. right? You got a couple of twos, you got a, a bulk of threes, you got a couple of fours to make it fun. Um, anyway, so you, you figure like, you know, let's say I've got a mech that's, you know, a thousand uh, BV. That's our target medium mech size. And our average pilot's a three, four. So we know the modifier for that is like like 1.38, I think, or whatever the hell it is, right? Yeah. So. So now my, my, my battle value per mech, my average battle value per mech is around 1380, right? Yep. You know, we would agree to that. Uh, and and so, another way to do it is you just kind of say, we want this to be like more of a medium or a heavy force. You just pick a mech with yeah. that pilot and just figure out what that BV might be. And you kind right. of work from there. You just find that average battle value. Yeah, however And then want. that sort of is how the rest of the system is scaled yeah. from that point. Exactly. So we said 10 mechs, we said 1380 we get 13,800. Maybe we decide to round up, yep. you know, whatever. Let's say we decide to round up to 15,000 because that's an easy number, yep. right? And it gives you a little bit of room to add some heavies, <clears throat> whatever you want. Whatever, you know, yeah, exactly. And so when you do your math, right, you're, and you pick your mechs, um, the next thing is really, you know, making sure that those pilots that you pick get assigned to those mechs, so, you know, and so on and so forth. But that comes last, right, picking mm -hmm. your mechs and forces. The next thing to do... And this is a big deviation from the Chaos Campaign, is how we handle support points. So this is a term we took from Chaos Campaign, because it's a cool concept. Um, but one of the things that we did was we made it more finite, right? You start with a supply pool, right? So support points, right? This is your supply line. This is, you know, what right. you brought on your dropships or what you have resource sort of infrastructure coming into it. We assume each force has some sort of support backing financially yeah. Whatever logistically yeah 
that you don't have to earn or win through every mission. So as you'll see, we actually do reward that through salvage exactly. and other things to, to pad that. But predominantly, you start off with a pool, and it's up to you to manage that pool throughout the campaign. Right. So a slight deviation and, and, and just a sort of a philosophical difference in how we saw support yeah. points so that way both players had an equal footing going into it with logistical support tactical support you know per mission yeah um and it's really up to you to sort of manage that and if luck damage you know fate right. turns you the other way you're you're sort of hard pressed to spend it well um we have a recommendation in the in the actual pdf you can check it out but the point is you want it to last a certain number of missions, and again, we target like three to five missions. We, you know, four is sort of our sweet spot. Um, we don't want these campaigns to drag on indefinitely. You don't want to grind, you know, the the mission right. flowchart until somebody finally gets to like I take over the capital. Like that's great, but like at the end of the day, in reality, you're going to grind until you can't support your supply line anymore. Your or your mechs are too damaged. And you can't keep your your or your vehicles, whatever your infantry is all dead, whatever right. it might be. Um, and, you know, you got to back out of the fight. Yeah. Right. I mean, because we're playing once a week on average. Right. So basically, four missions is kind of where we try to hit that sweet spot. It's a whole yeah. month of play. It's a yeah. good. It's a good feeling, campaign. Right? Good flesh feeling. out. We kind of have that narrative, and then we move on to the next one. So for us, it's kind of like that best of four. Yeah. Our support point value is sort of tailored for that. Yeah. Yeah. I. Yep. Yeah. And so you know, it works out really well uh, in that regard. And so. Um, you know, again, check out the recommendations. You guys can figure out what support pool amount works best for you. You can kind of look at the repair uh, costs, which we'll go over later, and sort of anticipate, well, I think, you know, I'll lose these two mechs, and this guy will be at 50%. Yeah. It's going to cost this much. to. So however you want to do it. You can also, um, you know, use support points as a way to um, sort of offset differences in pilots, and you know, pilot yeah. and gunnery. Like if you're fighting against the clans, maybe the Intersphere has like a much you know, bigger support point, uh, pool, right. you know, or more forces on planet, whatever it might be. Um, one other interesting comment about support pool that we we're talking about a little earlier tonight was, um, it does not necessarily need to be fixed for your whole force. Like if you want to play, you know, everybody brings three companies, you know, you could have support point, support point pools, <laughs> uh, dedicated to each of your companies. Right. And so yeah. that sort of gives you that feel that they have their different supply lines what the goal is, is to make you sweat bullets when you take an engine hit, right? Sure. Like it's going to be expensive to repair. You have to think about it. You know, do I want to spend the money to heal this pilot or do I send him into battle yeah. with three hits? Like, these are the decisions that make the game really fun. And, and I think that, that was kind of our benchmark. It yeah. was like, what's it going to take to survive four missions? But you're hard pressed and you really have to think about how you proceed with repairs and other... Yeah. decisions on in that in the metagame in between missions right yeah exactly um and so the last thing really is assigning forces right so um that is basically picking the mechs picking the vehicles picking the infantry assigning the pilots to those you know to those vehicles and mechs right determining the battle values making sure it fits into the force battle value that you agreed on um right so let's say we chose fifteen thousand. Before you come to the table and play the first night, both players have to agree, this is my force. Right. Right. Here are my 10, in our example, here are my 10 mechs. Yeah. Under that BV cap, you, you sort of announce it, publish it. This is what I'm coming to the table with. And it's not necessarily you don't know what I'm playing night to night, but you know what my full array is, the total BV value. Yeah. And another important thing is with variants, where we stick with the variants and the pilots we assign. Right. And that's more going along with the fluff, right? There, you, you, in a sphere max, you're not changing variants, you're not changing loadouts mm -hmm. on the fly, right? So whatever your mechs are, it's sort of what you're coming to battle with, and the pilots stick their mechs. And we have rules that we will cover later that talk about replacing pilots or hurt pilots, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's obviously a thing that is done. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, a pilot's healthy. He's going to pilot what he it's is. What his, his mech. mech. Yeah. You know, or mech. her mech. Or her mech. Of course. <laughs> Bubbles. Ah, the best. The queen um, of mean. So, you know, and then you kind of brought up the point about <clears throat> Undersphere mechs, and, and it does... Um, sort of give Omni mechs that intangible benefit of being able to switch. Um, and we don't have rules for that yet. Um, you know, we will certainly add stuff as we, you know, move into the clan invasion time period. Um, but sort of the, the preconceived notion that we had was that, 
you know, um, non Omnimax, you know, those variants would be fixed, but Omnimax, right. you know, would not. Because we, so, we love to customize, so we we often come to the table with customized variants. Love it, because I love it too. You know, but it's so great. We want to stress the fact that you're sort of that mech was built for that specific purpose, and you can't just flop around like. You know, my catapult is going from a K2 to a C1. Like, right. you know, it's just it not happening. Happen. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and so, you know, that's that. So basically, we've gone through the whole campaign setup, right? We've talked about everything from, you know, the fluff all the way down to picking the specific mechs, units, pilots, etc. for the campaign. Um, and so, you know, the, the next big thing really is is the campaign basics. So getting into things like the tracks and the missions and the objectives and how all that works, victory and, and defeat. Um, so. Oh, a defeat. <laughs> all right, so let's let's get into that, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so here we are, campaign basics, the next section here. Back to basics. Back to basics. So this section covers um, how to move through the campaign mission to mission, what missions you can pick, how do you determine who's winning and losing, uh, so all of these types of things. So uh, the first thing is this notion of tracks, yeah. which is right out of the Chaos campaign. Uh, I really like it. So it's basically like, um, well, actually, so in Chaos campaign, a mission and a track is the same thing, right? You're on this track, you play this mission. Yep. So we've abstracted those two things um, for a couple of reasons. One, because we love our missions. Uh, I love objective-based missions. I think they're really cool. It adds much more, I think, dimension than just, like, I have to go destroy you and kick you off the map, um, which is also fun from time to time when we do play those types of missions, right. but the objective ones are cool, too. Um, and, two, it gives you a little bit of unknown, like, it gives you a choice, right? Like, you don't know what mission I'm going to pick. Am I yeah. going to go for your buildings? Am I going to go for, you know, your, you know, your convoys? Right. Am I just going to try to do a straight-up battle? Um, so there's a little bit of excitement, you know, track to track. Right. Um, the track is less a mission anymore, more like the theme of missions I like that. that occur based on the the flow, right? Because that the tracks per campaign, you know, per chaos campaign, and what we adopted as well is more the flow. It really it looks like a, it's a workflow, right? right? It's a flow chart of sort of how the campaign progresses mm -hmm. based on who won or lost the last, and then the, the type of missions available changes based on right that that disposition as the as the, the campaign moves along yeah so mission tracks follow almost identically what is in chaos campaign right where we now provided a set of missions within each of those tracks exactly. that the victor gets to choose from to basically say if i won the first mission now going into track two i get to choose of two or three missions of how I want to proceed. It sort of gives the winner that sort of tactical or strategic yeah. option going forward, how yeah. they want to proceed, and let, gives them a little bit of control. It's sort of the boon that they get for winning the last match and going forward. Right, and it is a strategic advantage, um, at, you know, and we saw that in the last campaign, right? Like where... Um, Why do we have to keep bringing up the last campaign? <laughs> <laughs> I won't bring it up. It's a strategic advantage, folks. Um, so anyway, so we've got, uh, this notion of attacker and defender. Yeah. Um, and so attacker and defender is mission specific. Mm -hmm. All right. So at the campaign level, we don't talk about attacker and defender. We talk about, we, we talk force about force A and force B basically, right? Because in the fluff, um, you know, Kevin made the point, like you could both be coming into a neutral planet, right? Side like, whatever you want. You just say, yeah, I'm force A, you're force B. Right. You know, you decide based on the fluff right. what's happening, right? Yeah. Is it a yeah. planetary assault? Is it just a straight-up skirmish? Is it a raid? Whatever, right? Right. Overall, someone might have been the aggressor. Someone might have been the defender or right. neither nor whatever. The tracks, though, follow this schematic of like that ebb and flow of battle where right. one person is initiating or aggressing and the other person is re reacting or right. defending. Right, right, right. And so those people follow different lines in that flowchart. So you guys can look at that. It should be fairly familiar if you've read the chaos campaign rules. So again, you know, a little bit of, of difference in the, in, in the terminology between attacker and defender. I think when you read through the PDF, it'll make uh, mm. a lot of sense. Um, so we talked a little bit about the track flow. We talked about attacker defender. Let's talk about um, our missions. So the cool thing is, guys, we, we packaged up all of our missions. Um, I think we put 
the finishing touches on them. I know some of you guys, and thank you, pointed out a couple of like, you know, uh, the one the one critical one where, you know, we were counting one thing. Well, we didn't intend it that yeah. way, but the like in the escort mission, it was worded as such where like, you know, things were supposed to be scoring twice, but they weren't intended to be that way. So I think we've cleaned all that up. Yeah. Uh, and they are at the, at the end of the PDF, all of our missions. I think there's eight of them. Um, and they're pretty fun. So um, they have... And yep. the beauty of this system is, is that the tracks will remain static, right? It, what we're right. going to try to do is over time, because you know I want to do this, is as we, oh, you add can them. add on missions and even yourselves add missions into the mix, you just align them to a track, right? Whatever fits thematically, they can go into multiple. And that's the thing you'll see too. Certain mission types we have, like a recon or right. a pitch battle, whatever it might be, can fit into multiple tracks. They just... Don't fit in all of them. Yeah, they don't fit right. in all of them. And, and as we come up with more missions, basically <clears throat> they can just expand yeah. into the track system. Right. However, they fit thematically. Right, exactly. Like, you know, so for example, uh, the first track is contact, right? And so the only missions available are recon, intercept, and seize ground, right? And, and those thematically make sense. Like, you would yeah. not land and immediately go to seek and destroy where you're trying to like blow up his factory it's like you know it's something that's this you got to do some stuff first right uh, i mean you so, could and that's kind of the thing too right like if you guys want to do that you can but i yeah. disagree <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah right so thematically again and kevin makes a great point do whatever you want um we're definitely going to be adding more missions as like we, we you know we've already been yeah. sort of ideating on some exciting ones um but yeah so but the other interesting concept is, is so we didn't just stop with the mission types so as you get to see our missions, right, the missions follow a certain criteria of objectives to meet for the attacker and for the defender and how objective points are based. But there's also this concept of mission escalation, which is basically you have your force BV and you have your average battle value, but we wanted a way to have each mission perhaps be like a lighter engagement or a heavier engagement. Right. So the attacker, in addition to being able to choose the mission when they're going into that next track, they get to choose that escalation level. So it gives that extra level of they have control, they have the advantage, right? They have the initiative at the campaign level to choose. You know, I may be going into a, a, a seek and destroy mission, but it's also going to be like light mechs or heavier mechs in general. Not necessarily one type, but right. they... These escalation levels are basically just simple modifiers, taking that average battle value that your whole force is based on and applying a modifier that sets that mission level BV cap to say, this is gonna be a mission where we're only coming with say 5,000 BV versus 8,000 BV, which is all based on that mod multiplier that we yeah. have for each mission type. Yeah, so for example, like with our 1,500 point ABV example, right, our average battle value is 1,500. <clears throat> um, let's say uh, you pick a certain mission, maybe take and hold, and you pick high escalation. Um, I'd have to double check, but there's something called an ABV modifier. So that's in that case, I think it's 1.2. Yeah. So you take your 1,500, right, and you'd hit that, you know, by that 1.2, right? And then, so let's say we're playing four max, right? So 6,000 times 1.2, you'd be at 7,200 points, right? If my math is correct. I'm you just going to assume. Yeah, let's just assume. Let's pretend that math <laughs> works. Um, so, and, and so 7,200 points is, is what you would play for that, right? So as the attacker, you know, I'm, I let's say like I'm looking at Kevin's roster, I know I've decimated a couple of his key assault mechs, Right, and well, I just well, want to go back to my last campaign. Well, we didn't have any assault max, so I didn't <laughs> want to go back to that. I'm just making up a hypothetical. Uh, so <laughs> let's just say, you know, uh, Kevin destroys my key assault max, and he's attacking, and he knows, you know, he's kind of got me. So he can set up his mission, right, with that BV value, right, um, at 7,200 points or whatever, and that could put me at a disadvantage. Maybe I can't field the full BV, right? Maybe I have to forfeit because I can't field it at all. There are other options. We'll talk about this later yep. to hire mercenaries and do all their sorts of cool stuff with your SP. Right. Um, but, you know, so you can use this escalation level to sort of increasingly crush and strangle your opponent's ability to respond. Um, and that's intentional, right? When you have initiative in the battle, right, in, in a theater of war, right, and you're hitting critical supply lines and you're striking and you've got them off balance, like this is how these things typically would play out, right? right. So uh, we were trying to sort of bring that to life in our rule set. 
Um, I, I, mean, I love it. I think right. it's worked out pretty good so far. Um, and I think you'll see later with the rules we've added that, that we're going to come into later. Support points and other options that you can spend those support points on. It's not debilitating. Right. Like when you're at a disadvantage, right, if you're on the attack and you're choosing something that's disadvantaged it, disadvantageous to me mm -hmm. or vice versa advantageous to you yeah it's not going to be like i'm stuck with a suboptimal force and i'm screwed i just right. might have to take extra measures spend support points i don't yeah. want to or m assemble a force that's not exactly what i wanted to exactly to match right. that bv or at least to meet your force that that kind of gives you that edge that's sort of your bonus in the campaign for having you know wanting the last match or the last two matches whatever right? right it's sort of that continuity of campaign um it's just yeah, momentum the momentum it's a great yeah great word for it um yeah i mean i totally agree so um let's talk about a little bit about winning and losing right yeah. so in the missions um so the escalation level is defined in the missions the other thing that's defined by escalation level is mission parameters right so you pick yeah. uh let's say you pick high seek and destroy or high escort those buildings are going to have more construction factor the vehicles are going to move a little slower but have more armor right so the the escalation level can also affect some other mission parameters as well um uh, but uh, on to winning and losing objective points right so objective points are sort of the currency by which you win and lose missions so uh for example in take and hold right which is the one where you have a central objective and every turn that you're there and the enemy's not, you gain an objective point, right? right? So at the end of the mission, whoever's got more objective points wins. And this was a big digression from the Chaos Campaign, where we're not tying the missions into this war chest system, right. or a system where, based on the outcome of a mission, it impacts like your overall campaign economy or right. or progress, or like like how 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 much you're winning by. It's sort of I got crushed in that mission or whatever. Whatever happened in that mission stays in that mission. You lost the battle, right? Mm -hmm. you, you may lose the battle it's due to the objective points, but beyond that, you're awarded. We ha we then sort of separated out the objective points at the campaign level to be these victory points, victory points right. which are more similar to the war chest points, but there's no like crossover where... Yeah. Uh, in the mission, you win a certain level of these war chest or victory right. points. It's just... At the camp, at the mission level, there's objective points, and you either get a major victory, a minor victory, or a draw. Yeah, which will basically map to how many victory points you victory get. points you get, and ultimately towards your progress in the campaign. But the fact that we're not really tying you down with, you know, yeah, right, I, I, and and so right, if you get a minor victory, it's one uh, one victory point. Right. Major victory is two victory points. And to your point, like, you know, if you get absolutely decimated on objective points but don't lose any mechs well you get two victory points for that but like i'm not going to penalize your support pool right right or your supply line right you know you just this way is what it is but if you lose the mission and your mechs get wiped well that's got a penalty in and of itself there's no need to pile on with additional penalties right so we kind of kept those things separate um those economies separate of points if you will um so that's kind of how we did that yep all right, so, so we talked about campaign setup. We talked about sort of the basics of moving through the campaign. The next thing up is combat. Okay, so combat is the next major section. Um, what is combat? What is combat, Kevin? So combat, I believe, is fighting in Battletech. Okay. This is uh, part of the game uh, where your plastic miniatures move around the board and shoot at each other. It's like the side metagame. <laughs> it's the metagame. <laughs> um, so this is where we just play Battletech, right? Um, and, and, you know, we have some sections on the basics. You do your drop de declarations, you place your objectives, um, you know, you, you do all, you, you select your home edge, you deploy, et cetera, et cetera. The drop decks are important. Um, when we play, we typically play where we declare simultaneously. So we make our lists in secret, right? So we know what the, the, the mission battle value is ahead of time. So Kevin, if, you know, Kevin wins, he says, Aaron, we're playing take and hold, you know, high escalation. We know it's 7200 right. BV. We both go to back, we make our lists, right? And then, you know, night of or whatever, we're like, all right, here we go. This is what I got. So I'm bringing it to the yeah. table. And we did, you know, we, it's kind of like that blend of that 
simulating like real world intelligence levels where mm -hmm. you, you may you kind of know what the force has and we we have that right you know what the total force is on paper but you don't necessarily know what they're bringing to the battle right you find that out sort of on the fly right and when the mission's declared ahead of time right because you got to tell me it's 7200 and you know i need a day to put my force together like i can kind of start thinking about like well based on what he's got left what's he going to play right and i try to it's kind of fun right yeah. um so um that's an important part of it the rest of it's just standard right you just drop and you play the mission um so there are a couple interesting things uh that we have around um retreating force withdrawal Auto ejections, which is like sort of an, uh, an addendum to forced withdrawal, right? Um, and then auto mission termination, um, which certain missions just end after certain things yeah. happen. And some of this we kind of came up with to streamline play and, and optimize time, and others are just right out of the rules. Like some of them are right out of the rules, like force withdrawal. Force right. withdrawal. So I think we tweaked a little bit, um, the, but the, let's get into it. So like there's yeah. force withdrawal, basically uh, as raw. The yeah. only difference is... There's one in Raw where, like, if you get three internal limbs or, I think, any two torsos, it's automatic. If three sections have internal hits, I, I think, think that's what it is. We, we dropped that one. That's right. just us. You feel free to play with it. If you like it, right. it'll probably make your games go quicker. But it seems like... How many times have you been playing Mech War and it's like, oh, I'm crit on my, like, two arms and my leg. Like, I'm not retreating. Right. I'm in the red <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> bro. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> this is it, baby. <laughs> All right. So... Um, so that's force withdrawal. So the other thing is retreating. So this is right. this is cool. Um, so again, we're we're in a world where damage is persistent, right? And so we wanted to simulate that. So mechs are not just going to go kamikaze and try to well, unless you're House Liao, you're not going to like run your <laughs> mech into the warehouse uh, full of explosives. Well, this is mission four, right? right. <laughs> so we wanted an ability for mechs to retreat off the field without the drudgery of waiting 16 turns for me to like move my dudes, you know, 48 inches across the battle grid, right? right. And it was also a level of sportsmanship just for, listen, I clearly got crushed this match. P please let me keep my Marauder right. too. <laughs> without without <laughs> abusing it to the point where, so like where we used to rules where there's certain ranges and mm -hmm. requirements to meet to retreat off the board per right. unit. Yeah. Um, but we wanted to institute a way that it made it, it made sense for where, listen, I have enough padding, enough distance where this unit could likely get off yeah. the map and, and flee the battle successfully, but also not create too much ease for someone to just pull that unit off, even though they're, they're in threat and I could easily get a kill there where, right, right. you know, someone could cheapen the system. Yeah, right, exactly. And it's certainly not there to like... Uh, allow people to sort of um, cheap out. So, so basically, the criteria uh, is this: you have to, you have to be conscious. So, if your mech warrior is unconscious, <laughs> he, he's not. He Seems can't like retreat. Saying, but you know, uh, right. he has to be able to move. Um, so, if you're immobile, permanently immobilized, um, or you just can't move more than one, you have you know you have zero MP, right? Um, or even if you have one MP, it doesn't count. So, if you only, I think if you have one leg, you go down to one MP can't retreat um and you have to be able to run yep. flank speed like whatever um you know that second mode of movement has to be available so you know if you've taken like double hip uh you know and you like you can't run without falling you can over. be at a mod right you can, right. You can take the mod not your total run but right. you have to be able to run but if it's like least. impossible to run like if you're always going to fail your psr right like if yeah. your mods are stacked to the point where you just can't run without falling over uh like things like that prevent you from retreating um and in order to retreat you have to be closer to your home edge than you are to any enemy unit any other to like from your that model so it's not your force it's just the model the unit that's retreating at right. a time has to be further to the home edge than any other for any other enemy that's right and that's the thing. So it's it's more of a unit retreat than a force retreat. So exactly. if, you, if you get all your units off, so you could even win a battle and have a unit retreat off the board just to get them safe, right? Like right. maybe you don't want to sacrifice that man. You don't want to yeah, lose it. Yeah, they're like hammering your atlas. So, You've got to get so it off So that the was board. another yeah, thing yeah. too. It was a way to tactically pull them off the map knowing that there's certain criteria met where you're not going to have to draw this out four rounds. Yeah. Right. Like you could have a mech and force withdrawal, you know, lost his side torso, you know, doesn't have any weapons to bring to bear, you don't want to lose that chassis. 
right? And so to your point, right, you could still be winning the mission, but you just want to get them to safety. You move them, you know, closer to your home edge than he is any enemies, right. and boom, you know, he or she is able to retreat off the board. So, um, you know, Kevin and I also kind of play, you know, like you were saying, sportsmanship. We have sort of a gentleman's rule in play where, you know, if there are, like, fresh mechs on the board and, you know, it's the mission's clearly won, um, you know, and, and you kind of agree to pull back, right, without inflicting more casualties on me. You don't shoot me, I don't shoot you, you know, and it's pretty much like your dude's not caught in no man's yeah. land. And the other important point we didn't call out yet is when you are retreating, you have to declare it in your movement. Oh, yeah, great point. And when you do that, you can't shoot. Right. Right. There's no shooting. You can't participate in the shooting round. So it's the sportsmanship goes both ways. If I declare that my wolfhound is retreating, he can't shoot in the right. shooting round, then I have to declare it in advance. That way you know. It's it's sort of the enemy sees he's tucking tail and running. Right. And you're kind of declaring that as well. And yeah. Yeah, you can break that, but if you break that, you're you're free. You know, you're open game. You know, you're free game to shoot, and you can't retreat anymore. You, you exactly. Know. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's a great point as well. Um, so what should we talk about? Let's talk about auto ejection. So you know, when you just, there are scenarios in forced withdrawal, and there may be rules for this somewhere that we've missed, um, but there have been certainly scenarios in our games where. You're in force withdrawal. And you can't withdraw. And you can't withdraw. <laughs> it's like, help, I've fallen and I cannot get up. You know, you're missing both your arms and a leg, but you're in force withdrawal. So what happens? Well, you just, you lay there, but that's ridiculous. And more importantly, the other force has to waste time Like pummeling you. Right, yeah. you're standing there shooting while you're kicking the other. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we just have an auto-eject, right? Like anybody with half a brain is going to get out of that mech. If you're in a vehicle, the crew's going to abandon the vehicle. Like... You're just gonna if you can't if you're stuck where you're at and you're you're damaged to the point that you have to retreat, you're getting out, right? So right. that's and our think, auto And I think you'll rule. see in the rules for for force eject, it's you literally can't even contribute offensively. So it's not right. even it's not know, even like you can prop yourself up yeah. and shoot. You literally cannot get up. So it's for um, the scenarios where you're yeah. literally useless. So it's just extra armor on the board that has to be melted. Yeah. So it's like. Listen, that pilot's calling it a day. Done. Yeah, they're calling it a day. Um, and so, you know, the last thing we'll hit on is the um, in this section is the... Um, mission termination. Yeah. And that's basically per mission. Right. There are certain thresholds criteria <clears throat> where you meet it. You know, for like a seek and destroy, right? If you destroy all the objectives, the mission terminates. There's no reason to continue it. From that point forward, you just assume forces withdraw in their current state, there's no reason to play out that mission once yeah. the, the victory has been determined and the criteria have been met for typically a major victory. It may be a minor victory in some situations, but it's clearly uh, clearly criteria were met to meet a certain vision, mission yeah. termination, and it's the current state of, of play, basically, it just ends there. And we there's It's similar to the um, retreating rules where it's like we didn't see a point to play this out three or four more rounds yeah it's just sort of call it there right and then the other thing is you know we have hard turn counters too right so all of our missions are set with a turn most of them are set with a 12 turn counter right um and so when that expires right same sort of deal so what happens to the mechs in play so it's assumed that at that point you know reinforcements are coming or artillery strikes are inbound or whatever's happening the you know the, the mechs on both sides or the units on both sides they need to pull back from the the field of battle um and so they're not concerned with shooting each other at this point they're just going to withdraw assuming they can withdraw so the defending forces can always withdraw right um or i'm sorry the vic the victor's forces can always withdraw if you're the loser um, and your mech, let's say um, your mech's immobilized but not in forth, force withdrawal. Let's say you've lost both of your legs, um, but that's it, right? Or, or your gyro's destroyed. Oh, actually, that puts you in force withdrawal. So let's say both <laughs> your legs. Uh, both your legs are blown off. You're laying on the ground. You can still kind of get up and shoot, right? But the mission ends. It's called a Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, so, <laughs> so you're laying there like Lieutenant Dan. You, uh, you're getting up, you're shooting, um, the mission ends, what happens? Well, guess what? You just surrendered your mech, right? right? And that goes as salvage, which we'll talk about in a little bit. That goes as salvage to the victor. Because, you know, your buddies aren't dragging you off the field 
uh, unfortunately, in that scenario. So, um, again, it's all in the PDF. Read through it. Feel free to cherry pick what you like, but uh, we, we like that rule. Um, and I also like having a hard turn counter on my missions. I like having objectives so it's just not this slugfest that drags on right. you know, forever, right? You're assuming there's other tactical elements in play, you know, strafing, air bomb, whatever. Like, you only have a limited amount of time to get in and destroy these buildings before, you know, the rest of the force shows up or air support shows up or whatever it might be. So, anyway. Yeah, I mean... That's pretty much it. So beyond the campaign rules that we have, battle combat plays out like it would in any other yeah. classic Battletech match. You know, victory is just determined by the mission parameters, yeah. major and minor with the objective points. And right. from there, we'll get into sort of the metagame, yeah. the salvage yeah. that happens, and yeah. the repairs, the downtime, all that expenditures stuff. Expenditures outside of combat. Yeah. All right. Well, let's dive into that. So we'll start with salvage. All right. All right. So we're getting close to the end here. So the next big section is on battlefield salvage. So this was one of the things that I thought was lacking in the chaos campaign um, in the sense that like, you know, it wasn't, it didn't translate the same way as I guess I thought you know, I would expect in a campaign system. So I wanted, you know, we wanted to kind of like yeah. modify that up. Because salvage is cool. Salvage is super have it. cool. Uh, especially when like you, you know, hypothetically take the head off a Centurion with an Auto Cannon 20. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you want to be able to, to field that Mac. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about, uh, let's talk about salvage. The first thing is um, <clears throat> spare parts, right? So we abstract everything into support points uh, but basically, what you do is you take the record sheet. Um, if you're the victor, you take your opponent's record sheets. Whatever's uh, destroyed, right, left on the battlefield, you basically look at how many sections are still remaining. There's a formula in the PDF, and you collect, you harvest, you know, that number of support points. That's sort of uh, representative of you, you know, taking actuators and peeling off unused, uh, undamaged armor, or right. you know, comm systems or wiring harnesses or whatever it might be. Um, you know, negative power couplings is that a <laughs> thing in battle tech and so you know getting all that can basically converting it into support points so that you can repair your own right. units uh, we, like we've kind of genericized it we've kind of dumbed it down so you're not like calculating like individual pips necessarily no but it's for just, the most part yeah. you're just getting you're, you're quantifying what's left of the mech into support points and that's really where you gain support points beyond your initial pool is right. this is where we added value to salvage. It's sort of where you can pad your resources. Right, and so bigger mechs give you more support points, right? So if I down an, if I down an atlas, right, I'm gonna get a lot more out of that atlas, you know, salvaging right. spare parts from it than I would, you know, a locust. Um, so that's spare parts, and that happens when the mech is destroyed. So we're talking like, uh, CT cored out, we're talking about engine destroyed, uh, gyro destroyed so so there's this concept of unfixable mechs right. um and that's three engine hits two gyro hits and then of course if the ct is destroyed and that's in the chaos campaign rules uh it's just not you can't bring it back to life it's just you know blown right. to smithereens and so you're just collecting picking up its teeth off the battlefield <laughs> as it were um there's just not much left right. and so, it only goes to the victor and the victor gets the salvage for anything that they lost and as well as anything point. that the opponent loss yeah yeah right that's a great point so even if you just you know your own mechs are destroyed right you can at least get a little bit back right on and it that. just flatly goes to whoever won the mission you right. just assume that they get that salvage um the only other tweak to that is we allow salvaging of full mechs mm. and so that's basically mm. where it's a not a cord situation right? right you either incapacitate incapacitate the pilot or you blow the head off right uh, you know, they, right, they auto eject, um, like, you know, you blow off both their legs, destroy their left torso, they have to be in force withdrawal, right, they eject, you get the mech. You can put the legs back on, you can rebuild that side torso and the arm, um, right. it'd be expensive, but you can do it, um, and so you get that mech. Um, and it's happened, it's pretty cool. So that, that's a nice way to sort of, you, you get to add for free, in a sense. Yeah. You know, mech to your roster, and it's sort of something you have to rub in your opponent's face. Right. You take your, your buddy's model. Centurion. Right. And then you just <laughs> paint its head a different color, and you put it back on the table. It's kind of how that... I like the idea of keeping their original color, you know. <laughs> well, if I blow off the head, I wouldn't repaint it red, Kevin. I would paint it blue. 
Fair enough. Um, so anyway, so there are scenarios though where it's just too expensive to repair, right? So if I, you know, let's say the Atlas, or you just simply don't want to, or you don't want it, right? <laughs> it's a, like you don't need it, right? It's it's a mech you already have, or it doesn't fit in the the sort of you know, it's a really slow an right. urban mech, for example. Maybe or I don't hard pressed for support points. Or you're right, it's late in the battle, right? You don't want to repair it. So that's a great point too. So, you know, you can instead just scrap it for salvage and you would follow the normal spare parts rules and you can collect and harvest SP from that mech as well. But it's yep. much more fun, obviously, to have that salvage hanging in your, your dropship. Uh, yeah, sort of the a trophy, trophy case. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's salvage in a nutshell. You know, you can check out the rules. They're pretty straightforward, I think. Um, the next thing, and this is a fairly big section, is um, is downtime. Right. Um, all, the, so, all the fun stuff you can do with your support points, more or less. Exactly, right? So in between missions, uh, there's downtime. And so, um, you know, the first thing is that, you know, when a mission is done, we talked about salvage, you kind of do that, that roster management piece, if you will. Um, pilots that, you know, have to auto-eject... Uh, or, you know, um, pilots who, you know, are in a cockpit that has exploded, they're considered dead, right? So for a fluff perspective, maybe they're MIA, maybe they're killed in action, maybe they're recovered, but either way, they're not getting into another unit or mech for the rest of the game, right? I mean, right. the rest of the campaign, that's it, they're done. Um, you know, you paid points for their BB going in, that mech or that unit's destroyed, so they're out now, right? So that's the first thing is, is making sure that those killed pilots are marked off the roster. You can't reuse them. Now, if you guys want to play it differently, that's perfectly cool. Um, but remember, there's a BV cost baked into that pilot. So, you know, you could very easily cheese the system by running a bunch of very good pilots in Locusts and then, like, ejecting them yeah. on Mission 1 and swapping them into your allies. So we kind of make, you know, we kind of made it a rule in our campaign system that those pilots that are associated with those units, they're just toasted, right? Right. I mean, we're, I mean even in an ideal scenario, they're hospitalized. They've, they've suffered some trauma. From yeah, right. Ejection. Right, ejection, I mean, even in the RPG, like when you eject from the mech, I mean, your dude gets messed I think you up. You automatically suffer damage. And it's, <laughs> it's like, just like guaranteed. Which makes sense. The least safe ejection system in the 31st yeah. century. Um, so, no yeah. No parachutes, the hard drop. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about unit repair for a minute, right? <laughs> so, unit repair is the big one. And this is where uh, your brain juices are going to get flowing because you really have to make hard decisions about. Um, and, unless you didn't tweak your SP pool right in the beginning, um, but usually you'll have to make hard decisions about whether or not you want to completely fix your mechs, whether you want to leave some lingering damage. Um, yeah. And so there's a table, and we very heavily adopted this from the Chaos campaign. Now, some right. of the, you were, you were talking earlier about some of the key differences, right? Right, well, we try to maintain the same economy as Chaos campaign. Right. So and we even left most of the same repair options as is. We just sort of expanded on it. Yeah. So instead of doing a full section, like the full chassis and armor internal, we basically allowed an option for individual locations right. where we basically introduced flat divisors of like five and 10. So yeah. for armor and internals, it's basically if you want to do one location, it's divide by five. Right. So in some cases for when you just have one or two or three locations, it's more economical to do yeah. the individual option. But if right. it's wholesale, if you have a little bit of pip on your entire mech you want to do it's actually more economical to do the full repair the the raw mode so to speak um but just adding more dimensions to you know allowing those minute repairs and sort of expanding the system it wasn't adding too much complexity it's easy yeah. to main manage and track yeah because i mean your whole left side could be trashed um but your right side could be completely untouched right. you don't and we really want to account for that difference of you know i suffered a little bit of light damage you know it might just be a pip here and there versus a mech that had it's armor shredded, and in the raw system, it was sort of like the same value right, for the same point. tonnage. Yeah. So we kind of wanted to account for that, where you had this option to do like a piecemeal repair yeah. versus the other. Yeah. Um, so I do like that. We added that. Um, the other option we added was the ability to... Um, well, for, remember, weapons, heat sinks, all that stuff, right? Yeah. So we, we scaled up, right, the, the, point, the, the, the costs on them, so it's yeah. not just where all of your internals are included in the internal. The internal repairs were sort of scaled down to just include the internal yeah. structure. And pips are sort of segmented out where we wanted to add more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? 
I don't know, just like more flexibility. Danger in, 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 in all that too, yeah. We're yeah. more value in like the mechs that are carrying or those critical components, right? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Right. So like repairing, you know... Like a crab that has nothing in its side torso, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, um, that's going to be easier to slap internal structure back together For than like a stalker with or like a banshee, right? 30 got, medium lasers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and, and so, and also, I mean, I was, when I said flexibility, I was thinking like, you know, like you blew out my, you know, my side torso. It's got a large laser and two smalls. I mean, I don't want to repair the smalls. Like, yeah. you know, it's not worth it to me. I don't care, right? I'm just going to patch things back together, get that large laser up and running, and I'm good to go, right? right. And I think um, the only restriction we have, and I think this is still from Raw, is you can't repair armor unless the internal is repaired. The only way we deviate is you don't have to repair right. the criticals necessarily. So you can leave a weapon system damaged, yeah, not having it repaired. But you still have to repair internals before you move on to armor. Just yeah, accounting right. you for have the to, internal because framework. there's nothing nothing to mount the armor to. And I and, and a lot of this was inspired from when we were doing the RPG, right? And we pulled all the repair rules. It was like from the Mercenaries Handbook and Tech Manual. There's a Tech Manual. Yeah, there were a bunch of books we were looking at. So a lot of this stuff is consistent, I think, with the, the general fluff of of the yeah. universe. So, um, so again, there's a table uh, in the in the PDF. Check it out. Um, the other thing is hiring pilots, right? So there are scenarios where, uh, you pilot know, got killed. pilot got killed, but the mech's still standing, you know, I, I, you know, Kevin blows off my centurion's head, you know, and I win the mission. Right. Well, that's my mech, right? I salvage, I salvage that whole chassis, but my pilot's dead. What do I do? Right? Well, you can hire new pilots. And, and the restriction that we have is you can only hire rookie pilots. You can't go out and hire these ultra elite or veteran, even a regular pilot. They're just gonna, they're just too hard to find. So right. you can go get an academy, a dude out of the academy, <laughs> and stuff them in your mech. Uh, you know, I think it costs like thirty SP or something like that. Um, and that's you know, you run what you run. It does not. Uh, it's going to adjust the the battle value of that mech going forward, right? So like when you pick your next mission, yeah. you know that if if I had like a two three pilot in there and I put a four five, that's going to adjust the battle value of the mech. Um, but other than that, there's no other tangible change to, you know, ABV or force battle value or anything like that, right? It's just... Right. Um, and I think we even allow it for you can replace an existing pilot, perfectly healthy, mech's fine, but maybe you just need to cut BV for a particular mission. You can actually replace a pilot oh, yeah, with a true. rookie, yeah. but then you can never bring that pilot back. It's sort of like a, we're, we're simulating like this pilot got fired for insubordination or whatever, right? Whatever it's it might like, be. <laughs> it's, it's a way to sort of really make an aggressive cut in BV right. and bring in a lower pilot. Yeah. Um, and, but, right. but it's permanent. So that's it's sort permanent. of the, the trade, the trade off at like the last ditch, you know, whoever you kicked out, it's for whatever reason, right there, there's some salt there that you, they're not coming back or without, you know, maybe they just got chicken pox, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. The flu. <laughs> the flu. <laughs> they're out. Uh, so, right. So that's a great point. Um, so for non-mech units in terms of repairs, one quick point on that. So if you're looking at proto-max or vehicles, there are uh, so there's a section in the PDF that talks about that. I believe in Total Warfare they talk about what's you know like sort of the corollaries, like so you can sort of extrapolate what's unfixable and so on and so forth. Um, because I know you know we're kind of talking in mech terms here, but all that stuff is is packaged in here um, as well. So we talked about new hires for pilots. What about Mercs. Purchasing, yeah, Mercs and and new mechs, right? So, yeah. um, so purchases. Uh, basically, you you might find yourself in a scenario. We were talking about this earlier. You know, seventy two hundred BV. Let's say you know your best four mechs. You can only get to sixty four hundred or sixty two. Let's just say I got decimated. I only have three mechs left in my roster. Even that, right? So, what do you do? You know, maybe you have enough SP that you can go out and buy a mech, right? So mechs cost one half of their battle value simple formula they cannot be upgraded with any other kind of pilot you have to go buy that rookie pilot right. so they come with a four or five pilot for the cost of 30 sp in addition to half their battle value and boom you got a you got a mech on your roster but it takes a whole mission for that mech to get to you Right. Right. So whether you're ordering it from the other side of the planet or it's coming out of the jump ship, whatever it might be. So prime two mission delivery, one mission delivery. Right. Prime, <laughs> prime one mission. Uh, so that is that. Right? The other thing is it can only be a stock variant. So you may have your custom variants, your, 
your customizations on a particular Mac, you know, we agreed it sort of has to fit into the narrative, the fluff of what you're buying. And as well, for the most part, it's just a stock variant. Right. No customization to it. As long as you can afford it, you take something that fits the era, the timeline, and the faction. You right. Just, Ticket stock, and you guys can agree, like you know what what stock is for you. I mean, right. tip, typically, like you know, we use Solaris Skunk Works. If it's in Skunk Works, it's stock, right? Assuming we didn't add it. <laughs> uh, you know, you can go on like Sarna.net, right, and check yeah. out all the that like a Canon variant. Basically, I think is kind of where we um, where we draw the line. So, um, but but that's a, that's another great point. So, Mercs, I'm so excited about this mm. one. This was a late ad, um, and we have not used this in our in our campaign yet. Um, but this is a really exciting option, I think. <clears throat> so, you know, when you look at the cost of a mech and you look at the sort of the support points that you'd have, um, I mean, it can get very, um, almost like overwhelmingly expensive. Right. I mean, because in the situation we just described, you both have to purchase the mech and the pilot separately right. to, to fill that gap. Yeah. And that could easily be, you know, a few and hundred. And it's going to take you a turn. Maybe you don't have that turn. Maybe it's right. go th mission three or post mission three going into mission four, you can't wait that turn to fill that void in your roster. Yeah, yeah. That's where Mercs come into play. It's yeah. sort of that quick fix, it's immediate, so you don't have to wait that one mission. But the drawback is you only get them for one mission, right. at least for what you pay. So you have to double down your payment if you want to keep them on. It's, it's the same cost, but you pay per mission to bring in both mech, rookie mech, the chassis you want, yeah, and you basically get to bring that into your roster as sort of that merc hire. So imagine 750 to start, right? If you want to buy and add like a wolfhound or something to your roster, you know, I think a wolfhound is what, like 840 something BV maybe, say 900. Yeah. You know, you're talking 450 of your original 750. To your point, takes a mission to get. That's a lot, right? So the merc, the merc piece is really cool because again, you know, it costs a lot less. It's a quarter. It's a quarter. Of the BV that right. the mech actually costs. Right. And instant delivery. Yep. Same day. Prime same day mm. delivery. Same mission <laughs> delivery. However, it doesn't stick around on your roster. It's gone, right? It's a transient yeah. thing. They show up. They fight for you. And that's it. It's, it's over. It's a quick fix. It's a quick fix. So um, it's an interesting option, especially late in the, in the campaign or even, you know, uh, midway through if you're really, you know, if you have a lot of mechs down that are being repaired. Um, and, you know, side note on repairs, some things, we didn't mention this, whenever you're dealing with internal structure or anything beyond armor, right, that mech's out for a whole mission, right? Pilot heals too, we forgot to mention that. Yeah. But, so, you'll, you'll find that all in the rules. But anyway, so that's why mercs are real good. If your forces are, you know, heavily, you know, diminished, they're being repaired, uh, you know, this is a great way to bring something in cheap and quick. So that Wolfhound that would have cost 450 now costs 225 which is much more manageable. And when you look at how much it might recall, you know, cost to repair like my Jenner with two engine hits versus just hiring a Merc for two missions could be a lot better, right? So yeah. again, this whole sort of downtime piece, um, very cool. I think there's a lot to think about. So, you know, I always enjoy like, you know, we'll play on like a whatever Friday night and I got like a whole week to like tweak my, my, <laughs> my, <laughs> my roster and figure out how I'm going to min-max my use of support points um so that's that yeah i think another important point that i don't think we mentioned is the choices you make in that downtime mm -hmm. right whether it be repairs purchases merc hires you can decide that after the next mission's chosen so we did not force the you know, the timing of that to be before the next track right. mission is chosen. We It's sort of a, yeah, fine. No, like, at least give give some mercy to the loser, or just the, you know, the, the, the downtrodden where the winner picks the next mission and track, and then they can make those downtime decisions in the That's coming week yeah. without, you know, it's it, there's not like a timing thing there where there's a dependency on making them decisions before the mission, mission, next mission is chosen. Well, it's important, right? Because you know it gives you an idea of what you need to bring to the table, so you can economize a little better, right? So you don't have to like repair everything not knowing what you're going into. Like you know, you might decide like I'm not going to repair my Cyclops because I'm going into a light mission next, right. and you know, I'm not going to need it, right? So uh, it's a great point. So um, that that's that, right? 
Um, that's basically salvage, that's downtime. The last section in the book is battlefield support. I don't want to go into it in, in great detail, but check it out. Uh, you know, we have some tips about when and where to use it. Obviously, like having a, you know, a, an array of like long toms firing <laughs> on, you know, your, uh, your immobile objective is total cheese. So, you know, I think you got to set some ground rules about what these things, you know, your heavy bombers can and cannot target. Um, but these are the battlefield support options right out of the Battletech manual. They might they might be in the new Total War too. I don't know. Um, off the top and I of think my head. We, we ended up finding a way to streamline it right into our economy of support points by just multiplying yeah. the native exactly support values times ten. Right. I, I think so. So it's scaled. You know, so it's the same exact scaling between like a low density minefield and you know right. heavy you know aerospace. Support and I think we whatever. compared the impact, the value of like the damage that they apply and the, like the usability of them. They they balance well just yeah. at that flat times yeah. ten multiplier with all the other costs we have going on. Yeah. So it, it's a nice option. Uh, we have some rules about like when you have to declare those supports. So you can't just go into a mission and just be like, oh, turn five, by the way, I'm bringing artillery. Right. It has to be done with You declare your force them declaration. in advance with yeah. your forces, but then the timing, those follow the raw rules as far as when the mission, you know, mid match when you have to declare them in right. the attack round and things like that and how yeah. they resolve. And so, you know, we play on a, uh, obviously a hexless battle mat, right? You know, the, the battle grid as we call it. Um, and so I stole rules out of Alpha Strike um, in terms of basically declaring a grid, right? Um, I, I tried to be a little bit more articulate in terms of, you know, X, Y, like, you know, um, my sort of home edge is, is sort of, you know, the beginning of my Cartesian plane, if you will. <laughs> but basically, you know, it's the same general concept. Instead yeah. of picking hexes, I pick an X, Y, like, you know, 48 by 48 inches, I pick 12, 12, you know, that's here on the map. You know, I write that down on a piece of paper. That's where my predetermined artillery strikes come in or, or whatever, you know, we're doing. Right. So And our so, hexes are equivalent to one inch. So that hex or that inch you declare, that point you declare, so it's one within inch. one inch. Yeah, or one inch. yeah exactly. Um, exactly. So, you know, that's that's that. That's all the stuff that is in there. Um, you know, at the end of this, uh, this packet is all of our missions. Um, you know, and they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, basically all the things we talked about, um, major minor victories, yep. you know, uh, the objective the, points, right? The, exactly. Exactly. Objective points, the mission, para mission parameters, um, you know, the escalation levels, all those things are in there, all the special rules. Um, so check it out guys. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this. Um, well, you know, I know a few of you guys have asked for this and have been very patient while we kind of dusted, uh, Dusted it off and put the final touches on it, dotted our, our I's and crossed our T's, but it's here. A lot here. of tears were spent <laughs> grooming, grooming these rules. It's true. A lot of a lot of arguments over email. Yeah. A lot of compellings and... So many. Dracona, you know, Corita were lost in the, in the <laughs> process. <laughs> no no Draconis combat. No Fed Sons were harmed in the production yeah. of this. Except for the awesome that took the headshot. That yeah. poor guy. I'll never forget him. All right, so that's that. How yeah. do you feel? I feel good. So, I mean, you know, these may change over time. Some small adjustments. I think, we'll, obviously, we talked about I wanted to add some missions. Mm -hmm. But I think, with the most part, it's expandable in that sense, right? Yeah. The, the, especially with the missions and other areas, it's something we can expand without impacting the rules overall. I think we found a nice system that sort of works with the scale of play that we work with. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're aiming for, you know, those short campaigns on the tabletop that last, you know, half dozen or less missions and then you kind of move on. Yeah. It works really well. And it's obviously, it's been optimized and sort of benchmarked based on Lance v. Lance, but we tried that. That was an overarching, you know, theme and, and concern we had going into this is we wanted it to be scalable, right? We wanted right. to have mixed arms be a possibility and as well as bridging different tech gaps, yeah. you know, and timeline, you know, you know, Places in the timeline of BattleTech, but um, yeah. you know, we'll we'll adjust as we move on. Yeah, and you know, I mean, we talked about maybe even converting this over for use with uh, with Alpha Strike as well. A very easy sort of mental leap to get to, you know, that right. I mean, instead of BV, you're using PV, and there's just some changes in that. You know, obviously, repairing is going to be a little bit different, yeah. but um, so you know, lots of lots of cool stuff here. But anyway, um, guys, thanks for watching. I uh, hope this was informative. Definitely get over to the website, again, www.dfawargaming.com. 
Uh, check out the download section. And we'll probably be supplying the direct link to the PDF in our yeah. comments. In the comments, right, in the comments below. These comments. What's that? I'm not even looking. <laughs> uh, so with that said, guys, have a great night. Thanks for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. Give us a like, leave us a comment, and let us know what you think of this campaign system for classic Battletech. Uh, but thanks again. Have a good night. Stay tuned. A lot more coming from Death From Above Wargaming.